sufficiency. You know, in the Old Testament, what, what were they supposed to teach? Everything in the Old Testament, right? They're supposed to teach them all the Torah. They're supposed to teach them the law and the prophets and the Holy Spirit, right? So the, we're talking about the legacy of your parents. So by honoring your parents, what do you have? Everything. Because you're gaining self-sufficiency. In other words, you know, and plus, when I'm young, my parents support me. And then, because you were honoring your parents, right? The honor, the, the, um, the honor part is on the child, not the parent. And in Hebrew culture, you can see why, why right? The parent is already self-sufficient. The parent already has wisdom, we hope, etc. The child is the learner. The adult is the teacher, which is hopefully the way it should be in every family, right? So as we move forward, the child is being taken care of and owes their self-sufficiency or their sufficiency to the parent. And then as the parent gets older and the child becomes self-sufficient, now who does the child take care of? His children and his parents. His children and his parents. But who's the primary? The children. Well, the parents. As a matter of fact, and this is Hebrew. This is Hebrew Old Testament. Because we could prove another point through science. Right? We already did. Because remember, what is the most important thing in, re in the reproduction or sexual construct or sexual sexuality in human beings? Children's children. To see your children thrive or, be, or reproduce. So do you see that's a natural drive? That's natural. That's in science. That's what humans want to see. In spite of the fact that we've been taught differently for about 100 years, which is all bogus. Because they always did that before. The only ones who didn't do that were what? No, losers. Those, those who fathered children and didn't look after their children. I mean, even the monks and the popes took care of their own children. There's even a villa where, uh, you know, a via down in uh, Italy where the popes kept their children, right? So even the popes took care of their children. Wait, wait, nod, nod. So, you know, the big deal is that it is a natural, it is natural inclination for parents, for people to form sexual relationships for the purpose of seeing their ch seeing children and their children reproduce. This is a known thing. It's a provable scientific fact. What is not in science? Honoring the parents. In other words, what is a natural inclination for children in the scientific construct to do past sexual prime? Kill the parents. <laughs> Best thing to do. I mean, there's a couple of science fiction books about that. Where you know you have this culture and society where you kill the parents off. Because what do they do? What do they do in the animal world? They the yeah, they eat them sometimes. Yeah. Mm, nummy nummy, you know? <laughs> they kill their parents, they eat them. Because why would you kill the aides that are past their sexual prime? Resources. Yeah, resources. But yet we have an old testament, new testament construct that basically says, honor your parents. And by the way, where has that come into the other constructs? Culture and history, right? And legal to a degree mm -hmm. until the modern era. Because in the modern era, who do we let take care of our parents? The state. The state. In fact, I've had this, I've discussed this with people before. I had a person I was talking to, a friend, and I said, you know, I'd really like to do away with Social Security so that the children would and could take care of their parents like they should. You know, for no other reason than it allows you to honor your parents, right? And you know what this person told me? I wouldn't want to. I don't like my parents. I don't want to take care of them. Well, my goodness gracious. That's my point. You know, I'm not saying this to argue whether we need Social Security or not. However, I want you to know where, where you stand. If you agree with the state taking care of your parents, where are you? You're certainly not here. <clears throat> yes, sir. Well, I guess if you were, knew you were depending on your kids to raise you or take care of you later in life, you'd probably do a better Change job of raising them in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, that's kind of a fine point. Self. That's a fine point. I, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what we call that? <laughs> we call that moral hazard. <laughs> Moral hazard makes us do stuff that we probably never would do otherwise. In other words, 
If we know the moral hazard is that our children are going to be compelled to take care of us, <laughs> then we are going to make them the best darn citizens we can, right? They're going to be educated. They're going to have a good inheritance, uh, except the government takes that too. They're going to, you know, they're going to be whatever we think, you know, and like for example, I've been trying uh, under moral hazard, I've been trying to emulate my uncle. My uncle is the most sweetest guy in old age that you could imagine. You hear his stories over and over again, but well, that's okay. He's just sweet about it. He's just fun to be around, right? Mm -hmm. When you get old, you want to be fun to be around because otherwise, what's going to happen? Poof! Bye bye. So you need to start young, you know, kind of try to mellow, you know? So it's, uh, you know, out of there. In any case, you know, a family, what is a family? Culturally and historically, you know, science tells us, t science tells us, can't, can't fully define what a family is, but let's, let's look at a little bit. You know, family is, has always in the past, especially within culture and history, and even legally to a large degree, been defined as a group of DNA and sexually related individuals. DNA and sexually related. Now, in Judistic thought, in, in Judaism, Judaism, uh, the Jews have a very, uh, they, have a, they have a known adultery-based society. Now, what does that mean? They have a society where in the past, and I don't know if it's in the future, but in the ancient world, they have a type of culture that has been known for having a serious problem with adultery. Probably like our culture, or worse. And so in their culture, remember I told you before, who determines whether you're Jewish or not? Mother. The mother, because you never could tell who the father was. And if you remember reading the Old Testament stuff, you know, they're having sex with everything. You know, any woman that's moving, they're having sex with. So, you know, basically, they have a problem with that. And that is a known sociological issue. If you study sociology of groups, you'll know that in groups that have an adultery-based problem, they usually do that. On the other hand, Western cultures have tended to be what's called warrior-based systems. And in warrior-based systems, you lock them up. Well, in, also in the, in the Greek and the Orientals, you lock them up, but you're not very successful. In the warrior-based systems, you have a lot more success. Anybody know why? Where are most of the warrior-based, Western warrior-based cultures come from? North. North. Colder. Cold weather, cold growing seasons. You know, your basic growing season is about three months long. So if somebody kicks you out of the house, what do you have to look forward to? <laughs> Starvation and death. And because there are fewer men in warrior-based cultures, right, why? The men get killed off more. So there's more women. So you tend to see, which is really unusual, because in the advent of Christianity, what did all those Western warrior-based cultures kind of turn into? One man, one woman. <coughs> Right? Isn't that interesting? But in general, you find warrior-based cultures, you know, generally polygamous, uh, li well, a little bit of polygamy, but not much, which is interesting. But you might basically find that they tend to be less adultery-based. So therefore, in Western-based cultures, where do you find, where, where does the legacy come from? The father. The father. You know, the right of kings, right? The king, sires. Because why? In Western-based cultures, there's an assumption of procreation, and also, there's another thing going on there. In Jewish-based cultures, how long does a father have to acknowledge the child as his own? Anybody know? Seven days until circumcision. Because at circumcision, he does what? He names the child with his own name, or he rejects the child. By the way, Jesus Christ went through circumcision, and at that point, Joseph accepted him as his son. See? Very important point. Because in Jewish based cultures, in Jew, Jewish culture, there's this huge thing of adoption. But you notice, what child is acknowledged? Every child. Every child that's acknowledged is acknowledged. In other words, a father could say, I don't believe that's my child, and just go, Sarah pizza power. Right? He could do that. And then the child wouldn't be circumcised, and he would grow up as a... He'd be an uncircumcised Jew. Because his mother's Jewish, right? 
his mother could still accept him as hers because he is hers. So the child would still be Jewish and could even be circumcised, just not accepted by the father. But every child that is accepted in Jewish, every child, whether legitimate or illegitimate, is accepted by the father in circumcision. Therefore, the family is what in Jewish thought? What does that make the family in Jewish thought? You got a mommy, and you got the daddy, and who's the most important? The mommy. No, the mommy's most important, because you can't be Jewish unless your mom's Jewish. So the mom, and remember I told you already, the Jews believe what was the crown of creation? <coughs> crown of creation is XX chromosome. So Woman. explain to Ruth, how did she become seen as a, as a Jew? Ooh, I'm sorry, that's a whole class. <laughs> <laughs> I, taught, I taught it before, that's, that's a really deep question. That really is a deep question, and that literally that's a whole class, I'm sorry. But the point is that mom, mom in the Jewish thought is most important because she determines Jewishness, and also she is the crown of creation. The XY broken chromosome is not. And I've been through that, big time. So what does it take to have the children, children, what is it? Well, to have the children, you got mommy and daddy, but what makes a child a legitimate Jewish child? What makes it a family? The father accepts the child. The child is still Jewish, but to be the family, the father accepts it. The reason I bring this up is because Jewish thought, in Jewish thought, this is probably the cleanest familial relationship you're going to get. This is very clean, very easy. Because number one, and you can, you can back this up. I mean, this is, you know, we, we back this up again. The only reason I can prove for marriage is scientific, other than if I move into a cultural, historical, legal construct. But the reason for marriage is what? Is sex and reproduction, according to the scientific construct, right? I can prove that. And so, therefore, I can look at history and culture, especially Jewish culture, and I can show you, okay, I have marriage, and therefore I have family. And remember what I said, scientifically? The science says that they are DNA. You notice that this takes the DNA out of it. The mother provides the DNA, but the father doesn't have to. But they are still, the family is still connected by DNA. Now, also in Jewish thought, I, as the father, can accept a child that is not my wife's or my own. Remember who did that? Um, Israel, Israel, was it Israel who was going to do it? Who was going to do it? Abraham. Abraham was going to do it, right? Abraham was going to accept a, uh, when he did not have a child at all by anyone, he was going to accept a, and adopt a man who was his overseer to be his child. Remember that? And so in Jewish culture and law, we can do that. And you notice that legally, to make a family, you know, and a lot of this becomes amorphous, but we're pointing out what is a family historically and legally. We know that in our country right now, you know, a family is, quote, defined in laws a certain thing, defined historically and culturally as certain things. You know, whether you agree with them or not, it's okay. Uh, well, it's okay by history and culture. That's the way it is. It's not necessarily okay here, right? And it's not okay there, just so you know where you're going. But that's my point. So anyway, the family is therefore responsible. And in this, you know, the point you can prove is within the construct that we have defined here, which is very narrow, we can define, therefore, honor your parents. Children are required to honor the parents. What is a child? A person who is acknowledged and accepted by the father and born of the mother. And also we can have the added description or point that that could be an adopted child. So, we just defined a family within a very narrow field of a Jewish construct in history and culture. But why is that important to us? Because it relates directly to this construct. And remember what the first premise I made at the beginning of the class was? What are we holding to? Old Testament construct, right? That's the focus. 
So a lot of these issues, you know, we can see how some of them can be proven and seen within science. Some of that can be proven in our history and culture. I've been showing you those. But the proof, eh, it's just kind of amorphous. And that's why, this is why as an issue, what has happened in our culture about families? Bert and Ernie are going to get married. Yeah, Bert and Ernie are going to get married. And it takes a village. Does it really take a village? No, it doesn't take a village. It doesn't say villagers honor your leaders. You know? In any case. This is something that's very difficult to argue or defend or discuss outside of Old Testament, New Testament construct. You can move into history and culture, but it even becomes difficult there because you have to have a lot of knowledge to get into this subject. I would like to give you simple pat answers. I would really like to give you simple pat answers. Ones you could just say. The main thing is, where is the problem? Where is the real problem? Remembering the legal construct, what can I make legal? I can make anything legal. So therefore, I can define a family to be what? Anything. Anything. Anything I want to. Two cats, two dogs. Whatever I want to define a family as a village. I can define a family as a village. See? That doesn't mean culturally anybody believes it but I can make it that way, you know? I can define it to be anything, and this is the problem. This is the point. For example, you know, legally, we have allowed the government to become, we have allowed old people to become the ward of the government, which means the, the government owns them. If you're a ward, it means you're a slave. So therefore, the government controls and owns you. Pretty soon, uh, well, they already do this, you know, rationing health care is a reality. And, uh, by the way, I love this statistic. Okay, what, what health care insurance has the greatest uh, turn back rate? What was it? Uh, Non-acceptance non rate. The, there's another word I'm, I'm looking for. The, the greatest uh, refusal rate. You mean claim denial? Yeah, claim denial. Anybody know? <laughs> Medicare. 50% of claims are denied by Medicare. What's the next closest in private? What's the next closest? It's a private organization. Blue Cross Blue Shield. Blue Cross Blue Shield it denies, 90, uh, denies 3%. So private insurance denies 3%. Medicare denies 50%. That means they're rationing care already. Old people are dying today because of ration care. Because they are wards of the state. If you're a ward of the state and you're owned by the state, therefore the state can do whatever they want to you, basically. And that's the point. So legally I can do anything. So if I make the family a village, if I make the family two cats, if I make the family whatever I want, you know, that's cool. That's legal. You just got to realize where you are. Because that's not Old Testament, New Testament. That's not culture nor history. And that's not science either. See? And it's, oh, yes, you have a question. Um, because the question always comes down to who pays, and you know there are a, you have a couple of options in our country. You cannot be denied care, so if you fight hard enough, you may get it. That's number one. And number two, a lot of the care that's denied is care that was, you know, for one reason or another, not necessarily covered by Medicare. The point is that Medicare doesn't cover nearly half of what you know the private carriers carry. But yet, you're right, we, we still do unnecessary surgeries, you know, on people. For example, uh, a great example, uh, Tammy's grandmother in the last six months of her life had uh, hip and knee replacements and cataract surgery and never got out of her bed again. And she had a colostomy bag on uh, from years before and was probably considered not, you know, not even a good risk for any kind of surgery. Well, and that doctor was put away from Medicare fraud. And there you go. And her, the, the doctor was put away from Medicare fraud. Because we do know the measured fraud in Medicare is 23%. So if the measured fraud, by the way, in the civil world, when you go to jail, when your fraud level reaches what? 3%. Generally, 3% is enough to get you in jail. 
you know, if you're a private company. But Medicare and Medicaid, the fraud is about 23%. So at least 50% of the surgeries that are allowed, 23% of them are fraudulent. And that kind of could scare you too. My point of bringing up statistics like this is just kind of, you know, statistics don't necessarily prove everything, right? But they are a basis for proof. Proof text. That kind of goes to science. I don't really have time to get into great detail. But it's important to note, we already noted, you know, the government uses as a means of control <coughs> through law. And in some cases we want that, right? I mean, means of control. You want to put murderers in jail, and you want to prevent people from committing murder, right? So I have laws which are legitimate, which are Old Testament, New Testament, based in history and culture that say, you know, don't kill people, right? And if you do, I'll put you in jail. That's legitimate. We also have other laws, less legitimate. Um, the government can tax you for, uh, the government believes since the F, uh, from the FDR era that they can control whether you grow on your, uh, in your land the crops on your land. So even the garden legally can be regulated. So, you know, that's a question of law because the purpose of laws is to what? To compel, to control. The purpose of all laws is to compel. You gotta realize that. As long as you recognize that, everything's cool. So, you know, whatever laws you have in place are there to compel you, compel something or another. And I'm going to bring this up really quickly. For example, um, let's talk about this really quickly because this is a modern thing and a big issue. Um, there's a lot more that we could talk about because it's very important. But let's, let's just mention this. For example, what business does government have involved in marriage? It licenses marriage. Well, I mentioned this before. They license sex. But if you commit sex outside of marriage, what kind of punishment do you get? None. Uh, some states used to have anti-adultery uh, laws, but you know most of the states have wiped those off because uh, they infringe on your rights to what? Have sex outside of marriage? Um, yeah. But what right? What, what? What is marriage in terms of law? Taxable unity. You, you mean where does it impact law today? Because everywhere. Well, oh, yeah, property like ownership. Taxation, inheritance. Uh, you get divorced, what do you split? <laughs> okay, you just, you're hitting the point. You're hitting the point. What is the point? The point is who pays? Who pays? Okay, the compelling interest for government to be involved in marriage is who pays. Now, legitimately, the compelling interest of government is to prevent what? What does government really want to prevent with marriage? Two big things. Actually, three big things, but let's... Let's break them up. Three big things that government... Illegitimate children? Illegitimate children. Definitely illegitimate. You do not want illegitimate children. But we don't punish those who have sex outside of marriage. So the compelling interest has gone <coughs> away. What's the other one? Spread the disease. Well, that's a good, that's a good one. I, that's not bad at all. That's a great one because in the modern era, we found it to be true. You know, venereal disease is uh, epidemic in some places in this country, especially on college campuses which is, should really bore you. But um, that's not necessarily what I'm thinking of. I was thinking of, okay, the contract between a man and a woman, the purpose of marriage is to protect what? Property. Well, the interests of both in terms of property, okay? Because if you're making a lifelong relationship or a relationship, hopefully it's lifelong, you know, the, the compelling interest of the state is to protect both, the, both properties individually and severally. In other words, you know, the property that was two properties now becomes one property, and the state protects that property and those individuals. And the third one, the, oh, it's clear, it was really clear in my mind. Maybe somebody will come up with it. What's the third reason? Compelling reason for the state. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Taxation. <laughs> well, that's good for them, but not necessarily good for the family. The third reason is that the state, you know, the state doesn't want illegitimate children because they don't want to take care of them. The state wants, and the third one is, the state has a compelling interest to ensure that that unit or those that grouping, that family, is strong and intact because what, what happens to future citizens? That's what builds a future citizens, right? right? Those are the compelling interests of the family. 
What has our government done with those compelling interests? Does the government care about illegitimacy? No. no. Does the government care about, uh, for example, the property of others? Basically, they don't because they have no-fault divorce, which says, you know, that which was several and in, what was individual now is several becomes individual again, which is no compelling interest. And what about the last one? Is there any real government programs to try to keep families together other than abusive families? Isn't that weird? To keep abusive families together but not work to try to keep good families together? I don't get that. But in any case, my point is this. What compelling interest does the gov our government have in doing anything or controlling marriage? Zero. Yeah. I, I'm not quite sure I can go along with that because okay. one reason that we have the divorce laws that we have and why you have the concept of alimony and child support is so that and individuals take care of those people as opposed to becoming wards of the state. Yeah, I agree. But what happens when you have a little illegitimate child? <clears throat> now, I don't disagree with what you say, but but I will tell you that you know Tammy works with people all the time who have multiple children by multiple women, and none of them you know, and, and they're not getting they're not paying, they're not getting a job because then the state would compel them to, to <coughs> garnish their wages to take care of their children. What you so again, I, I ask the question, what compelling interest does our state have in marriage? Now, if the answer is it has no compelling interest, then what's the point of, for example, other types of marriages? Like if you want to marry a cat, does the government have a compelling interest? No. Well, who cares? I mean, I'm not saying this flippantly. I'm saying this as a matter of law because I believe the government has given up any right to have anything to do with marriage. You see my point? You can take this to any social concept. In other words, ask yourself the question, what compelling interest does the government have in regulating or making a law compelling one thing or another? And then evaluate it in terms of, for example, what do they do? Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. You know, for example, you see an adoption today. It's screwed up, it's really messed up. It's not very good at all. But adoption is a good thing. Marriage has become a huge cultural war in this country. But again, what compelling interest does the government have to control marriage? They do, but they don't do it, right? But Lionel, I, yeah. I know the bell's wrong, but the marriage situation is not the institution. It is the legal rights. I mean, two men, two women are denied the legal ability of property and insurance coverage and all of these things. If, if secularly they hadn't defined it as marriage, the objection to it would be significantly less. Mm -hmm. Huey said, yep. that's the point. And for example, I would disagree. There is no such thing, They're, they have all the rights they want. If I were a homosexual man, I would have the right to marry any woman. I want. That's correct. You have the same rights. I have the same rights as any other person in this country. And likewise, a woman has the same right to marry a man. Because if marriage is defined legally as a man and a woman, then that is the point. My no, point you, mi you missed my point. I'm oh. saying that the, the fight is to define it differently, but the issue is they want to call it marriage. Exactly. I, I agree with you, and I don't disagree. My point is this. What compelling interest does the government have to define marriage? What compelling interest does the church have to define marriage? Because we believe, well, we don't, in our church, believe it's a sacrament, but Anglicans and Catholics believe it is a sacrament of life. Okay? And I personally think the marriage is a pretty high thing on the totem pole of spiritual and physical truth. Okay? So in Old Testament, New Testament construct, the definition of marriage is critical. That's my point. I'm trying to make you see that legally there's a huge difference. And if the issue of marriage went away as a legally binding issue in the country, what would happen to the idea of, for example, homosexual marriage? It would immediately go away. Because homosexuals don't want to be married in a church. They want to be married in a secular sense, so they have what they consider the same legal rights as others that are married. See, I'm not advocating homosexual marriage, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, that we need to evaluate this. Sorry, the bell's over. Thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for this day, and we pray that you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Is there another class is over? Yeah. <laughs> class is over. I